everybody else there are there's there's a chance i might get disrupted by by the dog and the postman or something similar so apologies if that happens i've uh, i've done what i can to minimize the chance of that happening um uh, uh, and also i've got two screens so if it looks like i'm not looking at you um uh, that's just because i'm concentrating elsewhere but i am with you uh, oh hang on like everyone else i'm struggling a bit with the technology so just bear a second um could i just have an indication that you can see my yes. We can see that, Ian. It says team of Derbyshire on, on, up on the screen. Perfect. Thank you, Katie. Um, uh, so team up Derbyshire. Um, uh, I'm not going to speak for very long because uh, questions and answers are, are, are more important. Uh, so just uh, a handful of slides. So uh, the, the vision that we've created um, uh, is a real focus on, uh, on people who find themselves housebound. Um, and we're hoping to create sort of one team across both health and social care uh, who look after that cohort of people, um, and to create one team that 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 does all is needed. So whether it's an urgent, a planned, or an anticipatory, a planning role, this team will do it. Um, uh, and really crucially, we're, uh, we're 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 intending to do that by bringing together. All the people who are looking after uh, that that group of people um, uh, uh, and doing a great job, but not doing it uh, in as joined up a way as uh, as we or they they might like. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so that's the sort of the the, the idea, the plan. Um, uh, it started with um, a conversation around urgent care specifically uh, in the community. Um, so at the moment, if you're at home and uh, are in a state where you need help from uh, help from particularly health services, there's there's generally two two options open to you. You can you can ring nine 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 or you can ring uh, ring your GP practice. And at the moment, uh, whichever of those choices you make, um, uh, you get quite a, a a different response. But there are some some similarities in the response so they tend to be uh, a single clinician that would come and see you um that single clinician uh would be um uh, uh, would have a, a a medical head on them rather than a, a, a sort of a, a broader head and when they come to see you they'll they'll be under quite a lot of time pressure um so they'll be needing to uh get in and get out as quickly as they um, uh, really crucially safely can. So that leads to quite a lot of uh, quick, safe decisions, which aren't always uh, absolutely the right decision. Um, uh, and that safe word is important because um, making someone who's in crisis for whatever reason safe at home can be really time concerning it, it consuming it can be really uncertain um, in the home setting um, and it, it means that we uh, as a system rely far too much on hospitals as a place of safety rather than reserving hospitals for diagnosis and treatment um, um, we're quite away away from that uh, that overall vision, um, but the, 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 there are some uh, some sort of pre work to do to get to the point where we we we've got everyone together. Um, uh, so the bit of work that I've been really um, focusing on uh, recently is is bringing general practice um, up to the uh, the scale where it can integrate with the other services. So uh, providing GP home visiting from a primary care network level within a community rather than uh, an individual practice level. Um, also within DCHS, um, both Ben and mine host organisations, the Derbyshire Community Health Services, uh, we've been doing similar with uh, rapid response nursing and therapy um, and also adult social care, both through, through Derby City Council and Derbyshire County Council are developing rapid social care services, um, um, recognising that, keeping people safe at home. Uh, 
almost always has got uh, a social care element and often it's the social care element uh, that's more important for keeping someone health, uh, safe at home than the health element. Um, once those are all uh, working on that similar population at a similar scale, we can then bring together, bring them together, interlock them, integrate them. Um, that year one and year two to three um, is um, is a, a large oversimplification because actually um, there are parts of Derbyshire where quite a lot of this is already happening. Um, just to try and bring it to life, uh, a, a, a brief um, uh, sort of case study, uh, it, it, it's fictitious, but based on quite a lot of experience. Um, uh, so uh, John, um, uh, our fictitious patient, he's 89. He lives alone since his wife died four years ago. Um, he nursed her through a long illness. He's quite fit for an 89 year old. He plays bells on a Wednesday afternoon, visits the pub on a Friday evening. Um, uh, and his only real uh, medical uh, condition is he gets occasional gout. Um, gout, uh, if anyone here suffers from it, um, it's thoroughly unpleasant. It's exceedingly painful, uh, but it is transient. It comes and goes. Um, and there are really good treatments, uh, both to treat an attack and to prevent them coming. Um, this morning, John woke with gout in his left ankle, got up for a wee, found he couldn't stand and uh, got stuck on the floor by his bed. Um, uh, that's a bit of a rhetorical question, um, who should he ring? Because actually, uh, as I said earlier, um, he could ring 999, he could ring 111, he could ring his GP surgery. Um, uh, all of those would be appropriate, but at the moment you get a slightly different uh, response as I'm going to describe. So if he rings his GP, um, uh, likely to speak to the GP or someone in the team, they'll arrange for a visit after morning surgery. Um, John manages to crawl to the toilet and back to bed by the time the doctor comes at 2 p.m. He's in bed, he's able to put on a brave face for the GP, as so often happens. Uh, the GP agrees he's got gout, prescribes something to make it make it go away. It arrives at half past four that evening. Um, at 6 p.m., John tries to get to the toilet again, gets stuck on the floor, is incontinent, isn't sure what to do, so calls 999. Um, uh, the ambulance arrives a couple of hours later. Their options are limited, so they take him to hospital um, a good 12 hours after he first called for help. Um, if he rings 111, um, what would happen if he was stuck on the floor is uh, is they would direct that call uh, to the ambulance service. Um, so we'll stick next to um, so the ambulance service. Um, they come uh, help him up off the floor, uh, try to contact his GP, but uh, that can take some time, as many of you all know, if you've tried to have a conversation with the GP. Um, so they take him to hospital. Um, he gets to hospital. Um, uh, his gout settles in a couple of days, which is what you'd expect. Um, but by that time, because he's in hospital, he's caught chest infection. Um, this takes another week to clear, by which case, by which time he's unsteady on his legs, needs a package of care, which then takes another few days to organise. So ten days later, John gets home. He's lost all his confidence. He's anxious about leaving the house. He gets lonely. He becomes depressed. Uh, because of this, he misses his follow-up appointment with his GP. Um, so he doesn't start that preventative medication and two months later the same thing happens. With team up, uh, so the idea is it won't matter who he rings, whether it's 999111 or his GP surgery, they all link him to team up. Um, uh, they'll triage the call, they'll have a conversation with John and uh, they decide to send the paramedic out from the team. Um, uh, that paramedic's got more time, uh, would help John to the loo, back to bed, have a chat to him, examine his ankle, understand all the um, the, sort of the side issues, um, uh, discusses with the GP to confirm its gout, ranges for the prescription, which then arrives at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, because he also uh, has got that time to discuss and understand the wider issues, um, he links to the rapid social care team who arrange for two visits that day and the next, uh, and uh, arranges for the team therapist to bring some crutches so that John can get himself to the toilet and the chair and get around a little bit. Um, the following day, the paramedic rings to see how John is. Uh, he's on the mend, still can't wait, Bear, but the support he's getting means he's managing at home. 
Uh, so things are left as they are for that day. Uh, the following day, John's better. So the morning carer um, cancels the following visits, leaves a contact number in case of deterioration and lets the paramedic know through the team's chat. Um, uh, so the GP then uh, and the paramedic uh, talk through what needs to be done next. They both speak to John through a video conference call, um, uh, arrange uh, a follow up meeting with his GP, arrange a blood tests. Um, uh, and the paramedic learns all about gout, so we'll speak to the GP less next time. John goes to the pub the following night, tells the story of his horrible week, but how amazing the NHS is. Um, he only drinks sparkling water because he now knows that alcohol is a trigger for gout. Um, I'm hoping that gives you a sort of a sense of, of what we're trying to achieve. I'll stop presenting then. Uh, uh, let Ben have a chat about how that links into the care pathways work so more about where people do need to change settings and while he's doing that I might have a quick read of the chat because um, I can see there's been quite a lot of activity. Thank you very much Ian. I've, I've tried to respond to a couple of things there in the chat uh, so what I'll do now is try and share uh, my screen and see if I can get a uh, picture of the care pathways approach to to come up um, which may or may not be happening uh, not yet Miriam have you got that uh, yeah, diagram absolutely. to hand let me have a go That would be really helpful if you have. No problem. One of the things that Ian was um, talking about there was the concept of us trying to wrap as much care as we can around people in their own homes, where, where, wherever your own home happens to be. We know for a lot of the people who are housebound, you know, they are in, in their own private home, but they may be in care, they may be in a residential home or they may be in a nursing home. I don't I don't think that should matter or, or make a difference. Um, the other thing is to try and step up the amount of care and input that we can give to people in the community and around them in their own home. Um, so rather than jump straight from being in your own home to being in hospital, could we provide more care in people's familiar environment? Because one of the things that we also know is that particularly for long term conditions, thank you, uh, Miriam, for long term conditions um, to do with mental health like dementia or anxiety or perhaps people with a learning disability, a change in environment can be very stressful and can be very disruptive to their well-being and managing to wrap care around people in their own home can be much better. So one, one of the things that we've got nationally is a set of pathways, if you like, that um, define the amount of support that people might need. And what we've tried to do in Derbyshire is we've tried to turn these into statements that are I statements that, that matter to the people. So on the little diagram that Miriam's kindly put up, right at the top it says, I can go home. And I know the writing's really small, but basically it means um, you can stay at home or be at home or go home from hospital or and you don't actually need any further formal professional assessment or intervention. And nationally, they call that pathway zero. The next one down is called pathway one. And that's again about staying at home, being at home or being discharged home from hospital. But you do need an assessment. You need some form of professional working out 
maybe that's from physiotherapy, occupational therapy, social worker, um, about the care and the support that you need. But the point is, is that can be done in your own home or at home, or you don't even need to move out of your home for that assessment to be done. And then following the assessment, the care is provided. Moving on down, we've got two pathway twos. We've got 2A and 2B. And the reason they're different is to do with the level of nursing and medical support and care that, that can go in. So around the county, uh, in many places, we've got what we call community support beds. And they're very often in residential homes and they have a degree of support from the local uh, GPs and from teams of nurses and ther uh, teams of therapists uh, and social workers. And that degree of assessment suggests that you're not quite ready to go home yet. You do need a bit of help and support um, in an environment where there are people around. 24 hours a day, crucially, there would be people there overnight. And if you need the nursing support, then, you know, that that implies that your needs are that bit greater. And finally, at the very bottom, we recognise in pathway three people who have really reached the stage where it just isn't safe or possible for them to manage at home any longer even with all the care that we could uh, put in. And it, it might be a situation where there's been some, you know, really quite major thing happen to their health. Maybe they've suffered a very big stroke, for example, um, and the care and support that they need could only be provided in a 24 hour setting. And the, these would be, you know, very small numbers of people who from their own home needed to move into a nursing home or residential home or from hospital needed to go there. And the reason it's the diagram has got an inverted triangle is that the vast majority of people we hope and we want and we're going to work to make sure that they're in pathway zero or pathway one. And smaller and smaller numbers of people would require the higher and higher levels of care. And the idea is, is that we can use this to step up support for people in the community, but also it's there to support people if they do go into hospital and need to be discharged from hospital. So I think I've rattled on enough there about the uh, care pathways and it would be really good to sort of get into more of a conversation um, perhaps Miriam, Katie, you could help guide Ian and I about questions no in the chat or hands going up. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben and Ian. Uh, the first question that we had was submitted by Colin and he asked, um, can he's saying that he fully understands um, the, the wish to reunite patients back home in the community, but he's concerned that all the funding and services needed to do this will not be in place to deliver, as that hasn't always been the case in the past. And he was asking, will there be any additional funding facilities or staff be put in place to help facilitate this new approach? Yeah, you, you've been pretty close to how Team Up's been um, commissioned and funded. Do you want to start off? Uh, yeah, so um, at, uh, I think there's a, a couple of bits to that question. So um, the first one is around the sort of the, 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 the general practice element. So the sort of first box on that. Um, uh, so there is um, uh, additional resource into uh, into that. So across Derbyshire, it's quite significant. It's about uh, ten million pounds. Um, uh, so about ten pounds a patient, um, and that's been agreed um, on the basis of a sort of a three-year program. So that's in the system uh, to support the development of this for three years. Um, so I think that's one part of it. I think the other uh, 
bit uh, is around the change in the way funding's working in in the NHS. So for the past um, uh, uh, quite a long time, uh, uh, probably 10, 20 years, um, uh, uh, hospitals have been on a sort of a payment by results um, uh, tariff. So if someone goes into hospital, um, the, the, the hospital gets a payment uh, linked to that. Whereas the other bits of the NHS um, uh, have been on uh, a block contract. So sort of general practice community services get a chunk of money for to look after the patients they've got. And what's happened is over time, uh, demand has increased, increased across the patch, but because uh, hospitals are, are on that tariff and the others aren't. That skewed a lot of the resource into hospitals. That um, during COVID, um, uh, that tariff based uh, payment mechanism has changed. So now everybody's on a much more uh, even keel, which means it's much easier to predict and plan to invest within community services than it, than it was in the past. And then linked to that is the renewed focus on population health um, approaches to how we allocate resources um, and with that linked to health inequalities. So what that does is we know that uh, the return on investment, both for the health service and for society as a whole, is much greater if you invest in um, low tech um, uh, interventions to support the people in most need, rather than the high tech interventions uh, for really specific groups of patients in hospital. Of course, you need a bit of that, but uh, but it, it will allow us to, fingers crossed, in the future, be um, uh, pointed in it. it in a, in a more sensible direction most of the time. OK, thank you. And just to say um, the, there are quite a lot of questions that have been in the chatty and that Ben has very kindly answered. So I'm not going to read those out for now, if that's OK. I'll just move straight into the ones that haven't had an answer so far. Uh, Michael's raised the issue that it's not always easy to get an appointment with the surgery, especially face to face with a GP or on a visit is, is often very unlikely. I just wonder if you wanted to touch on the, the role of primary care. Uh, so, uh, yes, so uh, there's a really big question there around uh, supply and demand. Uh, demand is uh, is very much outstripping supply. So uh, the NHS as a whole is really struggling to keep up um, uh, because there's some additional investment into this, because we're lifting out uh, some of the um, uh, the, the sort of the, the the highest intensity users so people who are housebound it's about three percent of the population we think we know uh, sorry 0.3 percent of the population we know that also that that 0.3 percent of the population used about 10 percent of the resources so concentrating that one it will mean we'll, we should um, give a better response to, to people who find themselves housebound but on the other hand, it should also take some of the pressure off um, routine general practice. So hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, improve their ability to, 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 to respond. But yeah, there's a really big um, question there for the whole of society, I think. Thank you very much. Um, Can I just jump in, Casey? Yes, um, please. Because I think it would add to Ian's um, helpful answers on both of those points to just mention prevention, because it, it's so much more cost effective to prevent a problem than to have to react to a big crisis. And one of the advantages of Ian's team up approach, the Joined Up Care Derbyshire team up approach and a multidisciplinary team of people who are working together is that you bring together that professional ability to recognise an issue that maybe you can't solve, but somebody else can. And if that team are together, working together in the same physical space, um, and you recognise a problem and you can intervene early, then you, you do prevent a lot of more costly interventions from happening further down the line. So I think that's a, a good thing too. Thank you very much. And I think this has been touched on, Ian, but Alan's asked 
Um, is the equivalent of the team up approach in Derbyshire happening elsewhere in the country? And if so, have we got any kind of feedback or evaluation of how that's going? Um, so, uh, uh, so in developing the sort of the business case for it, we did quite a lot of looking to see who's doing what. Um, and actually, we didn't find anyone who is bringing general practice in in the same way we are. So there are quite a lot of um, uh, systems who are combining health, um, community health, so district nurses, therapists uh, with social care. And there are quite a lot that are taking the home visiting bit out of general practice. But what they're doing is they're um, they're just moving it to a different provider rather than what we're trying to do uh, in terms of it is is bringing it all together so that actually you've got a team doing it and that team's made up of the um uh, sort, of, sort of the organizations that are there um there's been a couple of questions in the uh in in the chat around finding gps to do all of this actually what we found found sort of in some of the pilots that we've got is that you need a gp to lead the team but what what evolves over time is that less of that contact is done by GPs and more of it's done by the uh, by the much broader team um, who are supported by the GP. So uh, actually, it, uh, the idea and one of the hopes is that it'll help with some of that shortage of, uh, of GPs rather than be a problem. Thank you. Um, ben, there was a question from Beverly saying what happens if a patient doesn't have the ability to use video calls? Yeah, I think digital exclusion is a really important point that we've got to constantly be aware of. It's all very well saying, you know, the pandemic and COVID has caused a massive jump and shift in people using Zoom and computers and what have you. That's all very well for those who can. Um, you know, our, our job in health and care is to tackle inequalities and to make sure that our services are accessible to everyone. So I think we, we probably are pretty reliant on the old fashioned telephone in that calling for help and calling 111 really ought to be the single route in. But then you know, aligned to what Ian was saying, we then hope from from that 111 call that people can be sensibly and helpfully directed to the response that best meets their need. For some people, that might be a video consultation, but for many others, it won't. And for those people who need a face to face visit, uh, you know, by a physical person, that should be what they get. And we need enough capacity within the system to be able to do that and to be able to direct the resources uh, without people having to go through multiple, multiple steps uh, to, to get what they need. Thank you very much. We've also had a question. I'm sorry, I'm going to address you as PP because that's how you come up in, as the call sign. But this person has asked, what is a neighbourhood? Because I think that was referenced in the presentation. Uh, it was, uh, that's a good one for me. So, uh, so, so there are lots of words we could use. So place is one that gets used quite a lot, um, uh, community. Um, uh, actually, what uh, what is sort of falling out is the primary, uh, we've asked primary care networks to, uh, to lead it and we've talked about a population of uh, 30,000 or more uh, and um, and the, the the important bit is that it's a it's a community that that makes sense on um, on, on on some level. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, one of the primary care networks, Derbyshire Dales, they've got an enormous geography all the way up from uh, um, uh, Buxton down to to Ashbourne. So they'll probably have three teams: one in the middle, one in the north, one in the south. Whereas in Derby City, where it's really difficult to uh, to cut it up because it's so geographically um, mixed, um, actually they're wanting to do it all as uh, uh, as one team across the whole city. Um, uh, so it, it it depends very much on the communities and the needs of the communities and how they're. Uh, how they're made up. Okay, 
thank you. And uh, Ben, we've had one from P C Patricia. She says this all sounds much more sensible and a real improvement for the patient. But how long do you estimate it might take to, to provide this approach consistently across the county? Well, we're starting already. Um, so there's pilot sites in the north and the south already starting. Um, we've got quite a challenging time scale, really, um, because it's tied into so many other things that are happening, uh, you know, national programmes, national expectations. Um, what, Ian, you're closer to the actual time scales, but we're talking within the next year to 18 months, aren't we? Uh, yes. Um, uh, so the, um, the, the primary care networks are uh, are starting to organise themselves now. We've talked about uh, them having their teams up and running this time uh, next year right across uh, Derbyshire. We've had to build some flexibility in that just because of what we've all been through through the, through the last year. So uh, it may well be that they get too distracted by um, whether we get a third wave, um, uh, what the vaccination programme is going to look like. Uh, so it may take a little bit longer than that. Having said all that, some of it's already happening now and some will happen quick, more quickly than that. And um, I, I would use Derby City as, a, as an example. Um, they're really well on the way. Um, Thank you very much. And then there's a question from Kath. I'll just put it to either of you. Are the links to the voluntary and community sector involved as well? So are, are you working closely with the voluntary and community? Uh, I, I'm going to take that one because <laughs> I've had quite a lot of conversations around that. Um, so, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and this should make it um, much easier for um, uh, health, social care and the voluntary and, and charity sector and community sector to, to work together. And th there are some a few mechanisms for that. Uh, so one is uh, the role of social prescribers and local area coordinators. Um, uh, they'll have a much smaller team, so they'll be part of the team up team and um, should build relationships in into the team and will uh, share that expertise. There's also um, uh, the local place alliances where we've got uh, representatives from from all the organisations, including voluntary and uh, and the social uh, and the charity sector, um, having conversations about what happens in their local uh, community. And the, that's mirrored at a sort of a, a system strategic level where it all uh, runs through the joined up Chair care Derbyshire's place board. And again, there's um, char charity and voluntary sector linked in there. Uh, I saw there was a question in there around uh, housing. Um, uh, same answer. Um, uh, the idea is to is to really bring that together and to try and link it all together and build those um, sort of relationships. Thank you. Uh, Mike's asked, is the intention to join up services provided by both internal and outsourced service providers in order that we can fulfil this, this approach? I wasn't quite sure what was meant by that. Then maybe you've got an answer. Mike, I mean, would, would you like to unmute your microphone, Mike, and, and put you might be able to put a bit more context in. I'm sorry, I'm probably not doing it justice. No, sure, no, pro no problem. Um, yeah, th thanks for taking the question for starters. Yeah, more about some of these services that actually are provided then are potentially provided by already outsourced, outsourced partners that are worked with. Um, so both for teams that are actually within the NHS or the other authorities, or are we looking to partner those up then with actually then any of the outsourced providers? I guess I'm still not quite sure. Have you got an example of an outsourced provider? Uh, on some of the social care areas, buying your community equipment that you spoke about, then often that's yeah. outsourced. Yeah, yeah. I mean, part of the requirement within the integrated care system that we need to uh, put together and make work is that we're, we're, at, we're working together with local authorities in the same geographical footprint with a lot of the same um uh what would you say um 
teams working together, whereas previously we might have had to do laborious referrals between different teams. This point about team up is that it's actually now becoming the same team. People are sort of, you know, being encouraged to put their employer's name badge to one side um, and work together to deliver what's needed. So in terms of already outsourced things like equipment that would need to be provided, I would argue that you've probably got an economy of scale around contracting, for example, an economy of scale around the uh, volumes that might be needed across Derby and Derbyshire as well. Um, I don't think there's any, you know, this isn't about trying to um, subtly shift towards the private sector. This is very much about keeping it within public sector provision, but bringing together what was previously separate, which was local authority and health. Yeah, yeah. just just coming back on that, if I can. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm not really um, wanting to enter into the discussion of whether it's you know staying, obviously, then um, within the actual public authorities or the health authorities or, or our sources just to ensure this works effectively and joined up, then obviously it needs to be cross parties, not just in the situation of being the actual then uh, local authorities or NHS. It has to engage then clearly with any of the other external partners that may be. Sounds like that's the intention in any case. So thanks. Thanks for that. It, answer. It, it's got to because we haven't got all the resources and we haven't got all the answers. Yeah, you're right. As long as, long as that's part of the agenda, that's great. If it isn't, it should be. Uh, so I think there's there's two examples where we we, we could uh, use that. So one is around uh, social care provision. Most of that is uh, out, it, it is within the private sector. Uh, quite a lot of people in health don't understand it and don't understand how to interact with it. But their colleagues in adult social care absolutely do. So it's it's that link between. Uh, the people who know their bit of the sector so that they can um, uh, increase knowledge. I think the an, another similar one is, is that there's quite a lot of uh, particularly physiotherapists who who um, are private providers but work a lot with the NHS and again those relationships quite often are really local so um, you've quite often got a, a, a dynamic private physio in a in a community who does a load of work and actually linking the, them together is yeah absolutely part of it. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, w did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Sarah, did you want oh, to unmute? Uh, yeah, yeah, please. <coughs> yes. um, can people hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sarah. That's great. Yep. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, they're not really questions, but <coughs> I'm just to be, a, a, for everybody to be aware, that it's been a bit of a struggle this morning because I'm deaf, but I have some hearing. And what I have heard is good. So thank you, Ian and Ben, Dr. Wright. Thank okay. You. Um, the first thing to be aware of, and um, it's a continual issue within the deaf community. Um, yes, yeah, the first step is to ring 111. Well, there's so many of our deaf in the community who do not use and no they don't can ring so that's the first so to be aware that from the death perspective yes you're all hearing doctors um yeah you go about your work and yes but it, <clears throat> no that's one and just a, 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 to add um, I found the PowerPoint very interesting and yeah, went through before the meeting and yet yeah, what one thing that came up about the flyer, um, it was felt that not death friendly at all. 
um, and also not good for those people who first language is not English, rather wordy. <laughs> and it would be better if people thought about creating more visual flyers. And I, I rather suspect that um, there were no deaf people at no organisation uh, to be involved in the making of those flyers. It's, ob it's obvious because the word. However, the pathway information, the way, yeah, pathway one and then the paragraph and then split up, that was more easy on the eye. So just general two comments. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Katie. No, it's no problem at all, Sarah. Thank you very much. I suspect Ben will be very big headed now with, with the with the fact that you liked his uh, upside down triangle. So but thank you for making that and we, we, we will take note of it and we, we know the issues around the deaf. I don't don't know Ben and Ian if you just wanted to comment on that. Oh, it's it's incredibly helpful, Sarah. Thank you, because we're we're doing some work this week, in fact. Um, on the materials that we need for good public facing documents. Um, Miriam has been helping us with this and that flyer that you saw, I, I personally think is a really rough early version of something that we're working with. Um, ideally, we want much more in the way of um, images and infographics. Um, be very pleased and very um, helped by um, expertise from the deaf community or the blind community. Um, absolutely anyone with any, um, uh, um, you know. I, I think Ian that Ben may get better well, so. oh, um, communicated to people. Thank you. Um, uh, if, yeah, if I may, can I ask a question back to Sarah? So um, when you want to access, um, I'm going to use healthcare because I'm a GP and I can not understand it. How do, you, how do you do it and what, what works best for you? That, um, you're, ask, you're asking me, Ian, right. Um, that's a very, very difficult question to answer because, I mean, like you all in um, who are here this morning, you're all different, so you all see things differently. And um, what may be suitable for one person may not be quite right for another. Now, what often happened in the, should I say, our community if we are lumped together so it is felt sometimes oh better this way but it's not always the right way for some of our people in the community however uh, it is it has been found that to be more um now then Ben mentioned to the use of graphics. The more of that uh, is, is much better. Well, it's much better for those who do not have English as a first language. Do you think of that community? So, Thank you. Yeah, graphics, simple, not simple, but clear, basic. Not word, you know, sentence after sentence after sentence. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Sarah. Thank you for that. We obviously we'll, we've captured the recording and we've we've got everything in the chat box as well. Uh, we've had a question from Val saying our local hospitals are part of UHDB and the trust also covers Staffordshire. Will staffs be joining in with the team up approach so that patients discharged from RDH may actually live in staffs? Uh, so that's 
not in the plan at the moment, um, uh, partly because um, uh, yeah, the, the 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 community that I'm working with at the moment is is the uh, uh, includes Derby City and County Council, Derbyshire GPs, and Derbyshire Community Health Services. Um, I suspect Staffordshire have got their own plans, but I'm not sure what they are. Um, uh, that conversation hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, if we're successful, then we'll be going out trying to trying to. Uh, persuade other people that it's the right way, but uh, but honestly, not yet. That's that's just a step too far in terms of managing the ma managing the headspace, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And Michael asked, I think it was in relation to a conversation in the chat box about is is the time allocated to each visit when people go out to see people? Will there be time allocated? Uh, so th the short answer is is no. I think that uh, links back to the same question around uh, and Ben's answer around video video consultations. Actually, the intent is that it's um, very person centred. Knowing this cohort of people and the variability in their needs, I think we need to be able to um, uh, cope with um, uh, spending as much time as is needed. That of course will be balanced against how busy the service is at the time, but um, uh, but but know that 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 flexibility is uh, there and intentional. Thank you very much. We've also had a question from Helen saying, uh, Ian, is there a single person I can contact with comments about team up as it develops? Please, I've already had one person wishing to comment about how, how adult social care integrates into this and they're interested to share their experiences and help to shape the service. Uh, so it depends a little bit on what uh, on what the comment is uh, uh, and where it links. Uh, I'm going to be really, um, uh, hopefully, not get knocked over, but suggest that Miriam is the right person in the in in, in the first instance, and then we between us can work out how. Because it might be through the PCN, it might be through uh, your local place alliance, it might be place board, it might be me. You know, it just depends a bit on what what the what the feedback is. I'll put Thank my you. email in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ben, uh, John said, is this focused on health and care workforce only or does it and should it recognise the potential input from the wider workforce? Uh, yes and yes. And we've already spoken about the um, voluntary sector, for example. Um, and I think what we so I said something earlier about prevention and one of the things that we're increasingly learning and being helped to understand from public health colleagues and colleagues in local authorities is the wider determinants of health. So in other words, it really matters that people have got a job. It really matters that people have got, um, you know, a, a warm, safe house to live in. It really matters that they've got support in their community and, and the wider workforce come into that uh, as well. Uh, not only about providing some of those things, but about recognising when people are suffering or coming to harm because they haven't got those things. Um, and that's where I think there's great advantage in working closely with the local authorities too. Thank you ever so much. Um, a question to both of you. Patricia said some, that obviously the links with the voluntary and community sector has been mentioned, but she's saying, are you thinking about how to engage with people in communities who might not be part of a formal, uh, you know, a sort of structured voluntary or community group, but who might be very willing to provide support as I suppose a bit like the vaccination programs mobilized lots of support workers, hasn't it? You know, voluntary support. Uh, they might be able to provide support to a neighbour who lives nearby and needs help. Uh, so uh, from my point of view, that comes through the link with the local area coordinators and the social pres prescribers. So uh, the, those groups of people have got a, 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 a particular 
remit around understanding and supporting the assets in in communities and now we we might do that together um, so i think um uh, that work comes through the link to, to 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 that work and those people rather than it being uh, the job of team up um if that makes sense um, uh, so they're absolutely linked but it's about sharing the jobs out i think Thank you very much. Carol's asked, will there be enough GPs to run this? As she understood that there, there was a shortage at the moment of GPs. I know we've touched on it a little bit. Yeah, um, I think I think I answered that before. So, um, uh, so I, we're hopeful that this will uh, improve that. I, I think for two reasons. So I sort of said earlier that um, the GPs who work uh, in this service where we've got it tend to end up supporting the team rather than doing a lot of the face to face work themselves. So I think th there's that bit that really uses their skills where they're really well uh, needed. But I think the other thing is there are a lot of GPs um, who work part time because of the pressure and relentlessness of the of the general practice day job actually that these roles within this team should be fingers crossed a bit less pressured so what i'm hoping is we'll attract um some gps to do uh, uh extra work or perhaps not to retire quite so early. Yeah. <laughs> thank you um I, I think both of you have touched on this but kath saying i think in fact you just covered it the question before ian routes into neighborhood support have been developed during the pandemic perhaps these routes could be utilised and supported in the future? I'm just going to say yes to that. <laughs> Good. Uh, so John said, um, if I have a problem and I can't get to the GP, would I contact 111 or team up? Uh, so uh, the team ups are, uh, uh, adopting a no wrong door approach, so it shouldn't matter who you ring. If team ups the service for you, it should get to you um, so whether you dial 999 or try and contact your GP surgery we're not planning to set up a new way in for team up actually the way the, there are enough ways in already we're just going to use them um, I think there's a there was a question in there around out of hours services so in Derbyshire our out of hours provider uh, is the same provider that pr provides 111 services and actually we're doing a lot of work really closely with them to make sure uh, the routes via 111 are good but also the handovers at the beginning and end of the day um, are good so that that works um, going on and linking to that somebody mentioned 24 7 so actually the, the the intent for the team up as it's set at the moment is to move to be eight to eight seven days a week mostly because the uh, what people need during the day and at night is quite different but that's not to say we're not linking in with to improve the offer during the night so um, Derby City again uh, an example where they're looking at how they might um, uh, develop their night sitting service so, so, yeah, so, so there, there, there are lots of interconnected interconnections there that are all being uh, worked on and uh, again brought together. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to finish with a question from Michael. I'm going to ask him to unmute his microphone if that's OK, because uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Michael, I wasn't quite sure, but I did want to say that I know there are a lot more questions in the chat box, so please don't think that we've not come to you. Um, when this session finishes, uh, Miriam painstakingly goes through all these questions and we do send them out to Ian and Ben, who will provide a response for you, and we always put them up on, on the document dialog page so that if your question wasn't answered now for which I apologize you will get a response to it so Michael I don't know if you wanted to unmute your microphone you've you've raised a question about making a telephone call to the surgery the system doesn't know if you are the person in need or not yeah that's true I mean uh, uh, the the answer phone at the other end of uh, the GP surgery doesn't know who's calling so how does it identify whether you're uh, in an urgent care or a, a gold standard framework, dare I mention that, uh, uh, patient? 
uh, it just doesn't know and you're sitting in a queue and it's often 30 minutes or more and sometimes over an hour before you get to speak to a human being and then you you might get the comment back oh somebody will phone you next week thank you michael uh, ben and i were talking about this just last week actually i'm thinking about uh did somebody uh, phone you back this week then <laughs> just um, so it goes right back to the beginning where there's that mismatch between uh, demand and the capacity to, to meet that demand. Um, and it's been made uh, paradoxically worse during coronavirus where everybody's set up um, uh, access via telephones and access via the internet. And actually what that's done is it's just opened more. So what's happening is you've got um, teams just trying to get through the work as fast as they possibly can and not not meeting it and i think it's a a major problem that uh we in the nhs and social care have got to tackle and actually investing in people to answer the phones just feels um uh, it's not given the priority that it needs to be because we invest in people to to, to see patients and actually um we're at the point where we really need to invest in in people and technology to to, to 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 man the phones so that we can really early on identify the people who need a response really quickly but that's very much a work in progress and I'm, well, I'm not here to offer any solutions to it yet it's a major problem thank you so much uh, can I just thank Ben and Ian for um, presenting on this session today as I'm sure you can imagine they're very busy trying to deliver on this so uh, they've found time to come and do this today as I've said all your questions will be answered I know we haven't got to them all today and I do apologize but thank you so much for contributing and engaging with us and giving the questions for us to think about I just wanted to let you know as we always finish on that the next session will be on June the 24th and that will be led by Chris Clay the Chief Executive of the Clinical Commissioning Group and the Integrated Care System and John MacDonald and they will be talking about um, the integration of care in Derbyshire as we move forward so how health and social care will be working together so some parts of that obviously um, linked very very nice segued I do like that word very nicely uh, into today's session so as always thank you so very much particularly because it's a lovely sunny day where I am so it's very good of you given that we've only had rain to join us today it was lovely to see you all and hopefully we'll see you all again in June and thank Thank you so much to everybody and we'll get to your questions and everything will be on our website thank you very much bye bye thank you katie bye